Facebook friends, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our participants who have joined from different parts of the world. Welcome to this concluding session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. This online conference is being co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and CNS. These sessions are also streamed live on the Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session is the last one in the series and it is on the theme of sexual orientation and gender identity and SRHR in Asia Pacific. I'm also happy to share that we have two sign language interpreters for the session, Lucy Lim and John Beliza to guide us through today's session. Unfortunately, one of today's abstract presenters, Saroj Tamang from Blue Diamond Society Nepal informed us just now that she will not be able to present today as her father has suddenly taken very ill and he's in the ICU. So we will have only three abstract presenters for today, apart from one plenary speaker and one voice from the front line. Just a few quick housekeeping announcements for our viewers before I hand over the mic to our chairperson. My humble request to all presenters to please adhere to your allotted time. There will be a prompt from the chairperson two minutes before your scheduled time ends, but I hope there will be no need of it. Audience, please keep yourself muted and your videos turned off throughout the session. Presenters are also requested to mute themselves when they are not speaking. There will be a question and answer session after all the speakers have presented. Those who are using Zoom platform can type in their comments and questions in the chat box. You can do so even as speakers present and not wait till the end. If you're watching, the program on Facebook Live, you can type in your question in the comment box. In the interest of time, please keep your questions and comments brief and precise. Also, we are living in challenging times and most of us are working from home. So please bear with each other in case of any technical glitches arising out of poor internet connectivity. It is indeed an honor for us to have Dr. Chivon War as the chairperson for today's session. Dr. Var is the convener of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights and the founder executive director of Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia. He also serves as an assistant professor at the School of Public Health, the National Institute of Public Health, Cambodia. He has dedicated his personal career of over past 20 years to SRHR and maternal newborn and child health. He is among the first Cambodians to start and expand family planning and youth health programs in Cambodia and has introduced innovative approaches in addressing women and child health in the community. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Shobha, for the introductions. I'm very happy to uh, join with you all for the last sessions. Uh, of this uh, virtual uh, series conference uh, today. So uh, as we all see in the schedule, today's sessions run from uh, 1 p.m. in Phnom Penh time to uh, 3 p.m. And then we don't have uh, one of our the speakers. So we have uh, one plenary speaker and three abstract presenters and one voice from the front line. Before starting uh, inviting the uh, speakers, um, I'm, I would like to share with you that uh, sexual orientations and gender identity is one of the crucial issues for the countries to ensure respect for all gender diversities and ensure basic rights of all individuals are respected and protected. In this sense, understanding and addressing sexual orientations and gender identity, which is the subject for discussion today, is uh, very important 
to achieve equal access to sexual and reproductive health and other social service, including participation in economics activity. Sexual orientation and gender identity is one of the very important elements to achieve universal health coverage, which we promise, we all promise, we leave no one behind. So now more than ever, and in Cambodia the same, I'm glad that today we also have our partner Rock. And I would like to emphasize that uh, now, you know, more than ever, sexual and reproductive health and LGBT activists are getting together, make concerted effort toward equal rights among all individuals, regardless of their gender identities and sexual and orientation. Today, we are honored to have uh, five distinguished uh, speakers, uh, presenters come together to talk about their work on these very important issues. So, um, and uh, as I said earlier, so our plenary uh, speaker is uh, Jaya P. Heng. And um, Jaya P. Heng is the uh, program team manager, Rainbow Community uh, Kampuchea. The acronym is ROC. She promotes LGBTIQ rights in Cambodia since 2015. And she involved awareness raisings and advocacy for LGBTIQ rights for key stakeholders such as local authority, government, officials, CSO partners, media, and general publics. Today, Jaya P. Heng uh, will talk about UPR as an advocacy strategy for SOGI SC issues in Cambodia. So the floor over to you, uh, Jaya P. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Chi Wan mentioned, my name is Lee Pei. My pre preferred pronoun is she and her. I'm from Rock uh, in Cambodia. It's my pleasure today to share our experience and good practices using a UN mechanism called Universal Periodic Review, which uh, Rock and other organizations, including RAC, uh, has submitted the report on uh, SOGI SC issues and LGBT issue uh, to the UN, uh, which was in the third call review in Cambodia in 2019. Um, so the, all, the contents of my presentations today will start with uh, the, uh, the, context, the context of SOGI SC and LGBT issue in Cambodia and how rocks work uh, in it. Second, we will look to the UPR itself, what is it and why we use it. Uh, third, how it uh, has, how was the result of the third cycle. And last but not least, the reflections from our team and coalition, how we learned from using uh, this uh, mechanism in our advocacy. First of all, uh, if you look at SOCHI SC or LGBT issue in Cambodia, uh, we have seen that we are very young uh, movement. Uh, the, the first movement was start with the health sector mostly and the discussion start in the 1990s and only in 20s, around early 20 that we start to talk about SOCHI rights. And we can see that in cultural and religion uh, perspective, we are more toler tolerant toward LGBT community more than other uh, places around the world. Uh, in one of our research in 2015, uh, there are the respondents of the straight uh, community who said that they believe that we, uh, being LGBT are their nature. However, there are still uh, the harmful norm and belief uh, that being LGBT is wrong against nature. Uh, therefore, our community is still facing a lot of uh, challenges, starting from family, which uh, we have uh, been uh, exposed to violence in all forms, including emotional violence, physical, economical, and some percentage, which I saw in the slides, has also thought and attempted suicide. In other settings, 
we see that uh, that uh, we, our community still uh, face bullying and harassment both at school and uh, at workplace and especially trans community who are more visible uh, of their identity. Uh, you can find this research on a uh, website of uh, our networks uh, called Cambodian Center for Human Rights. Uh, and I also, also attach the link uh, at the end. If we look at the legal framework, we see that uh, in our constitution, we are protected generally as a Cambodian citizen. However, we, are, we have seen the absence of a certain law that deprive us of uh, social benefits and uh, opportunity. Uh, four relevant law that we have seen, uh, that we have identified, one is uh, legal gender recognition for trans community, which there's no official recognition of uh, one person uh, self-identify gender at all. Second, uh, there's no uh, legal marriage for same-sex couple. Uh, third, uh, we don't have full adoption for the couples, which means that only one partner could uh, uh, be rightfully adopt the child. And last but not least, we uh, don't have the anti-discrimination law that could protect us from uh, at the, uh, from the harassment and discrimination at Minister team. So in general, uh, we see uh, our community are uh, better uh, comparing to other country. However, there are still uh, gaps that uh, did, that uh, let us fall, uh, fall through the vulnerability, facing vulnerability. Uh, coming to Rock's work uh, in this context, uh, we just started in the early 20s, uh, which when were the LGBT are still the taboo. Right now it's still the taboo, but at the time there was not much discussion on being LGBT and human rights. And we believe that uh, we could do strong advocacy when we are uh, being community and membership based, uh, sharing the issues of the real community and have uh, the inputs and uh, action taken by our community. Therefore, uh, we believe in collective participations of our members who are LGBT individual. Uh, they are well informed of uh, the uh, decisions and how they should make the, that decision and taking the actions. And that's including how we use UPR itself, which I will show a bit later. Uh, Next is on uh, our advocacy and awareness raising work, which we believe that as LGBT issue is uh, the, no the issue of uh, norm and belief, we believe that there's need to be the change of heart, mind, and also uh, law. And it has to happen uh, together. Uh, so it interactively and also could change uh, the situation uh, holistically. So we communicate the evidence base and we work on human rights base and proactively dialogue uh, with our, the stakeholder, including public, local authority, and government, uh, explaining why we want, why, why and how we want uh, the change. And um, we explain uh, the nature of being LGBT as we believe that uh, when we explain to them, they should, uh, they could accept us and uh, and the change will happen rather than shaming and blaming. However, we use the cultural and uh, cultural art and language to communicate those uh, the, the change that we want and changing all the narratives that people believe being LGBT is, is bad and also always facing issue, but we always we always have uh, the other side of us. So part of uh, Rock's work and nature are uh, the reason why we use UPO. But at the same time, uh, UPO itself convinced us to use the mechanism. So what is UPO? Uh, it's 
universal, which is which means that every country uh, review each other rather than a group of experts uh, give com- recommendation to one country. So they are transparent, open dialogue, and ready to assist each other. And it happens uh, uh, periodically, which means every four and a half years, uh, they will look back to recommendation that they have accepted or noted. Uh, so each state uh, can officially rec- uh, accept the recommendation and had to com- put the commitment to implement uh, them or noted, which uh, they also had to look all those recommendations if they have been implemented. And they review on the human rights situations, uh, which uh, stakeholder could join, including the state itself, the UN, and CSO of the country. So it's part of why we use it because it's more state owned. Uh, the they have the commitment to when they accept the recommendation, they should have the uh, commitment to uh, implement them. And uh, there's the peer remindings from uh, states who give the recommendation, giving assistance rather than uh, uh, keep blaming each other. And if we look at the background, we see promising opportunity because as the previous uh, two circle, there's no recommendation were made to our government on LGBT rights. And we did not have a, a coalition form and that's and in the third type call, we had it and we see it's as a good opportunity to bring the issue to the UN. Reflecting to the process, uh, it's all, uh, it, it tell us that we had made a good decisions. As you can see that we start from learning and understanding the key concept, uh, not just the teamwork, but also the member. We use an empowering approach that uh, we as a, uh, a right holder, we learn about this first. We know what UN mechanism look like, this UN mechanism look like and how it could be benefit to our community before make these decisions. And then we join with uh, other CSO to do the report, the full report, uh, where we try to lobby uh, the, our, the CSO network, uh, challenge them, uh, to see our issue as priori- priority as well, and at the same time to earn uh, support from them. And along the way, we grab resources like uh, at, like from other uh, other network in the region and also in the world. For example, in uh, from ASEAN Sochi Caucus, ASC. International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Trans and uh, Intersect Associations, um, and our FSU as well, uh, our donor, they had uh, support us financially, technically, uh, how to lobby in the country, in Geneva, um, what kind of tool to use, uh, which country, uh, and they consult with us. So that's the main process that uh, we feel comfortable and we feel confident to work with our network to uh, complete the report. So here as in picture, we have uh, the above on the left is the picture of our community consultation on the report. Uh, below is the one with the CSO. And the last one was when we did the lobby at Geneva. There's some more picture that I could not show, like some, like one we had to wait late at night waiting for recommendation and all those excitement. So as the result in the third cycle, we had nine recommendations for the first time on SOGI and on three topics that we prioritize. One is the anti-discrimination law, two, uh, same-sex marriage law, and three is gender recognition. And we have the state um, my other state members, seven state members who uh, show the commitment to assist Cambodia to implement these recommendations. But what does it mean to us is that Sochi Rice was, bring, was brought to spotlight uh, as a human rights and bring the visibility in Cambodia society. It reflects into the speech of His Excellency Kai Remy, the 
president of Cambodian Human Rights Committee, uh, which he spoke at the UN Human Rights Council, uh, highlighting the stance of uh, Cambodian government to eliminate the form of discrimination against our community. It's an opening for us. Also, he shared the, commit, uh, shared the way that we should uh, do more awareness raising uh, so that the public are able to uh, accept uh, our issue more so the law will come after. So we see that as part of proactively communicate dialogue, uh, talk and to uh, find a way together. So that's where we are now in 2020, although there's a COVID-19 pandemic happened, we still uh, actively share role and responsibility among the coalition of a set. Uh, we see uh, that there are some action that could be done, including uh, indoor uh, discussion, uh, follow up, and most likely to do the awareness raising at the public. Uh, some of uh, Rock's uh, activity, including cultural parade, that uh, we uh, slowly sensitize the visibility of LGBT in the village, uh, as well as uh, we, in, we, uh, we also celebrate um, same-sex couple love, doing the love contract at the village so that people start to sensitize and see that uh, there are people who accept us. Uh, when we cannot do the physical uh, things, we do the online friend or family as well. However, we see other uh, organizations in the coalition actively uh, do their job. For example, RAC has been actively working on a comprehensive sexual education curriculum, Love is Diversity doing online platform, uh, online uh, uh, sensitizations on supporters as well. So that's are some steps of implementing UPR. That's come to uh, almost the last of my uh, presentation today is uh, what we learned from this process. So we see the UPR as an advocacy strategy, but the process itself is very important. Uh, we do the, uh, when we able to consult, inform, uh, there's a more power from it. Uh, our community know what we want and uh, see the way that we can do it. And second, it's important to uh, to work with other uh, networks, both local, regional, and international, based on their strength. Um, and they could help with facilitations and uh, assistance as well. And third, we see UPR is opening a legitimacy platform for us to do ongoing uh, advocacy, including, for example, when we do the workshop with the local authority, we have a legitimacy reasons, uh, and we always have opportunity to talk with the government when uh, before there has not been a chance for us to, uh, to talk about LGBT rights, uh, and human rights and family rights together. So uh, with that, I come to the end of my presentation and I add some links to for the reference and resources. Uh, and if you're interested and want to see more of uh, our story, please uh, keep in touch through our social media. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Lia P, for excellent presentations and a fantastic job uh, you have uh, done with your colleagues for the LGBT uh, community. And I'm sure that uh, we all learn and the viewer learn the importance of uh, UPR as one of the uh, approach to um, address the uh, issues of the LGBT uh, people. So um, I would like to uh, invite the uh, second uh, presenters, Dr. Sarita Viswan. Sarita Piswan holds a PhD in demography and has been working at the Population Research Center in India since 2008. Her work involved monitoring and evaluations of the national PIP in Indian states. 
She is on the governing board of Women's Institute, Institute for Social and Health Studies and is a member of many other national organizations. Her area of interest are sexual and reproductive health research and autonomy of women and in implementing their rights. Dr. Svitvan, the floor over to you. Hello, everyone. Yes, we hear you. Today, I'm discussing with you on, on transgender issues in India based on available literature. Like many other countries, India's gender non-confirming persons also is fighting for their equal rights. And today, my objectives of the study are to identify the discrimination and denial of rights they experienced in their life from different spheres of life, that is from, from family, friends, and society as a whole. And how the heterosexual hegemony affects the existence of third gender. Uh, the methodology used is an online articles available free online published between 2000 and 2020 in English. GStore, PubMed and Google search were done to find out articles on transgender issues in India. Uh, totally, I have got on not five articles of which about 30 are based on primary data that is other than HIV related. related. Most of the studies based on primary data analyze the HIV and related issues among transgenders. Some common terms defined in the literature are gender identity, which is defined as the internal sense of feeling male or female. And in transgenders, this identity and actual sex at birth does not match. Transgender often refers to all gender variant people. Would include a person who have undergone surgical intervention to live in full time as a member of opposite sex, a person who occasionally cross dresses in private, and someone who identifies as both male and female or neither. Sexual orientation referred to each person's capacity for emotional, affectional, and sexual attraction to individuals of a different gender, same gender, or more than one gender. The process of transition through medical intervention is known as sex or gender reassignment or affirmation. Some of the known instances of discrimination are young women selected in the police force got dismissed after routine medical examination in Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra. Shanti Sundarajan won the silver medal at the uh, 2006 Asian Games in Doha. Her medal was taken back and humiliations led to suicidal attempt. Later, she won her battle and state government compensated her. Air India rejected application of transgender engineering graduate for the post of a cabin crew, through, though she was eligible. And the provisions made by the government are Amendments are made to eliminate discrimination on the grounds of gender identity and sexual orientation. And NELSA made an judgment ensures exemption of biological evaluation of gender for the purpose of law and ensures the right to decide their self-identified gender. The directions were, apart from binary gender, be treated as third gender for the purpose of safeguarding their rights under part three of our constitution and the laws made by the parliament and the state legislatures. Transgender persons right to decide their self-identified gender is also upheld and the center and state governments are directed to grant legal recognition of their gender identity, such as male, female, or as third gender. Directed the center and the state governments to take steps to treat them as socially and educationally backward classes of citizens and extend all kinds of reservation in all cases of admission in educational institutions and for public appointments. Center and state governments are directed to operate separate HIV zero surveillance centers 
since hijras or transgender face several sexual health issues. Center and state governments should seriously address the problems being faced by hijras or transgenders, such as fear, shame, gender dysphoria, social pressure, depression, suicidal tendencies, social stigma, etc. And any instances for SRS for declaring one's gender in immoral and illegal should take proper measures to provide medical care to TGs in the hospitals and also provide them separate public toilets and other facilities. Should also take steps for framing various social welfare schemes for their betterment and should take steps to create public awareness so that TGs will feel that they are also part and parcel of the social life and be not treated as untouchables. Should also take measures to regain their respect and place in the society which once they enjoyed in our cultural and social life. And still they are facing discrimination at familial, social and legal. Uh, families do not accept children behaving against their biological sex. And uh, social and uh, physical and verbal abuse they are facing as Legal, they are uh, facing false allegations, denial of rights, improper or inappropriate welfare schemes, and denial of political rights. As a consequence of all these discriminations, they are left out of home for freedom of expression, of identity, and living in unsafe conditions. They are uh, dropping out of school, or difficulty in getting jobs due to inadequate formal or informal education. Turning to other income generation activities such as begging and sex work. They are doing unsafe sexual life for various reasons. What we found in the studies are experience of conflict between gender identity and the anatomical sex usually occurs during adolescence. Some transgender individuals felt their sense of sexual conflict at childhood. Some others at later ages and some others felt fluctuations in gender identity throughout their life. A 25% higher rate of suicidal attempt was reported in transgenders compared to the general population. Different studies report employment discrimination between 20 and 57%, including being fired, denial a promotion, or harassed. The discrimination and exclusion starts from family, includes estrangement from, from family and friendship networks. Harassment at school, which can lead in some cases to underachievement at school, school dropout, mental ill health, and homelessness. This denies equal access to key social goods such as employment, healthcare, education, and housing, and also marginalizes them in society and makes at risk of becoming socially excluded. Limited knowledge and understanding of transgender people and the issues they face are understudied. There are increasing trend of gender affirming surgeries. Homeless LGBT youth miss out on education and social support during critical formative years. No studies in India conducted to identify the complications faced by them during the surgical procedures. Different studies in other countries reported arrhythmia among substantial proportion of gender non-conforming persons admitted for gender affirming surgeries. Study conducted among 120 transgenders attended the clinics, 48% reported dermatological infections. Among different subgroups of population, HIV prevalence is highest among transgender persons in India. Fifty-nine percent of transgender respondents reported experiencing any form of violence, and the main perpetrators were own family, relatives, and common public. Challenges were found in HIV testing as they experience more discriminatory attitudes from the health staff. 
they reported confidentiality laws in the area they belong and loss of income as some of them are depending mainly on sex work for their subsistence condom use is restricted with intimate partners and with clients due to loss of faith difficulty in disclosing their other relations and fear of loss of clients It's not going. The questions are asked from the review are whose fault is this? Is there or society or from the Khan? Who suffer? The parents and they themselves will suffer from internal conflict of feeling of being to other sex and whom to reveal. There is nobody to reveal their situation. Face high levels of mistreatment, harassment and violence in every aspect of life. And the promoting factors are the medical developments and changed social norms and policies. Uh, some of the measures we have to take take to protect them and to uh, give them equal rights are identify them in schools even at primary or secondary levels of education with the help of teachers give them support and prevent drop out of schools and equip them for continue education to higher levels increase community awareness to ensure equal rights access in every phase of life Family support is very much needed for the children who experience gender conflict at adolescence to thrive in the world. It is established by many documents that assessments by qualified mental health professionals are a necessary component of the process of transformation by surgical intervention. More con concrete and culturally sensitive education need to be leveled up for the general public about people who are disadvantaged because of their expression of sexual preference. Ensure proper implementation of the welfare measures, for example, false reporting of the gender category from family or acquaintances during inquiry for making available the schemes by the government or other agencies. More research and action are needed to identify and solve the problems faced by transgender people in different subpopulation. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wiswan. And uh, thank you for your works on the uh, studies and your findings and the conclusions. I'm sure that the uh, study is very useful for uh, all of us, um, the countries, not only in India, but uh, across the region and in the world. And we have faced similar issues. And I think your conclusion is uh, very uh, relevant. And we all need to uh, continue uh, what you have suggested. Thank you very much. So um, for the next uh, abstract presenters, we have uh, Sobo Malik. So Malik will uh, present limited access to health right resulting in increased self-medication. So Malik is the trans uh, woman from Lahore, Pakistan. She is a chartered accountant by profession and has been working in Dabaja Sira society for the past five years as the administrative and finance head. Kavaja Sira Society is a trans-based and trans-led organization working for the well-being of transgender of Pakistan. Sobo Malik represents the empowered segments of the transgender community of Pakistan, breaking the myth that the community is just involved in backing or doing sex work for their entire life. 
She has contributed in making her organization strong along with other team members and has also represented the community and its best practices at various national and international platforms. She actively participates in trans right awareness and empowerment and economic development of transgender community in Pakistani society. So, Bomalix, the floor is over to you. Uh, hello and uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, for me, it's like in Pakistan, it's right now um, 11.30. So for me, it's good morning. If like for other like countries, good afternoon, I would say. And thank you so much for um, APCRSHR for considering my abstract and uh, giving me the opportunity to represent it. And um, uh, well, I am uh, Sobho Malik and um, thank you for a great introduction as well. Uh, by profession, I'm a chartered accountant and I work for an organization named Khwaja Sela Society. It's a trans-based and trans-led organization and we work on transgender rights and their well-being. So, um, okay, and uh, the topic of my abstract is limited access to health rights resulting in the increased self-medication. It's a research on the transition process carried out by the transgender people in Pakistan. So, um, uh, we can start. Uh, can, um, Bobby, can you move to the next slide, please? Okay. So uh, the background of the objective is as that we've been uh, working on the health rights since 2012. So um, we and my team has been came across a lot of cases where the most of the transgender persons have limited access or no access to the medical facilities, uh, especially the hormonal therapy they've been carrying out, uh, the endocrinologist. We don't have any a specialized endocrinologist in our country right now. And due to which we um, observed that many of the, our community members have been on the self-medication. And um, um, when, when we've seen, so uh, we have to research on it because we were seeing that it is to some extent is really harmful for their lives, for their health as well. So um, for this purpose, as we were working on the health rights and we are working on HIV and AIDS and testing services, providing them. So uh, we were very keen to know that how they are doing their transition process because now the exposure is very much in our country regarding the transitioning. And uh, by the word of mouth or by the community members, as well as from the internet, many of our transgenders in Pakistan are starting this process at a very early age without being referring to any doctor, without taking any health um, test, without hormonal tests, or without being consulting to any psychiatrist or psychologist. So we've been conduct we, we have conducted um, a survey um, and one-to-one um, -one interviews with the transgender person, just to know like that how they begin their transition process from where they have been getting the knowledge of taking that hormones and how it is affecting their health. So, so I cannot hear you. Hello, uh, now you, you can hear me? Yes, you can be heard now. Yes, we can hear you now. So, sure. Thank you. So, yeah. So, the uh, so what we took is the uh, fifteen transgender women from the age of eighteen to twenty eight, who are on self medication from uh, minimum from the last six months. So, we interview have an interview one to one interview with them with an open ended questionnaires, so we can gain a lot of knowledge individually from different. Uh, secondly, what uh, we've done is like we um, get the trans the 15 transgenders were from different, uh, I would say, literacy level from different class. 
So though we, we took some of them from the grassroots level, those some who are empowered as well, and some do have some knowledge and some education uh, so that uh, like they have a little bit of concern and they have the knowledge how to uh, maintain their health and about the, uh, I would say, health standards. So uh, we started this um, uh, process and uh, we have we discussed the transition to free. We discussed the issues. We discussed the method they are following. We di we discussed uh, uh, their future, basically, whether they want to get into the castration process or sex reassignment surgery or uh, what they are looking forward. And secondly, uh, we want to know the main reason why they've been starting this self medication. So there, uh, so these are different uh, questions. As like we are transgender, uh, we are most of we have transgenders in our organization working. So we can relate this overall topic with us as well because as we and my colleagues are still in this like uh, transition process, and we do not find any kind of uh, I would say medical facilities or endocrinology specialists in our country. So it's a very hard, I would say, it's a very, uh, uh, as like we are educated, so we can get the information from the internet. We have the international exposure. We can have the information from the uh, transgenders living um, in the other countries who have access. Uh, we can, um, as we are empowered enough, so we can go and consult with the doctors on our hormonal status or uh, we can get the hormonal test but those who are on the grassroots level, who are doing the transitioning, they have no access, they have no knowledge, but at the end of the day, they have to transition themselves. They have to um, reshape themselves as women, or I would say to look like a woman. So they want to, um, they want to transition. And uh, for this purpose, they are just, uh, getting the knowledge from other transgenders and they are just uh, taking uh, the medicines and the doses which other are taking without being referring to their own like what what is going inside their bodies what they have the the hormonal status and the the level of hormones because obviously it counts when you have to take some medicine so uh, if we move to the next slide i can get on the findings we have, yeah. Okay, so when we took this, uh, the one-to-one -one interviews, we found that 15 out of 15 participants are on the self-medication in taking the medicines or they are injecting the hormones um, without consulting any doctor and without doing any hormone test. <clears throat> then 12 out of 14 were following the same dose as the other transgender friends, whereas, the, whereas three of them have some research on the internet, but they never consulted a doctor. As I said that like, we have a, a group of different transgenders from different class. So those are who are a little bit educated. So they research a little bit on the internet, but uh, 12 were just taking the hormones by consulting to their friends. Like, uh, so one thing is like, as um, in Pakistan, we have a Hijra culture and we live in the Dera. So the networking between the transgenders is very strong here. And mostly they live in groups. So when they see one transitioning herself or getting the body she want or getting the, the, the personality she wants. So they were uh, very much inspired and they just follow what she is doing whether she is taking hormones or going into um, surgery implants, or even um, I, I have seen that, like we have observed that many of them have been castrated, going into the castration process without being consulting a doctor or any psychologist, just following what the seniors are doing, what the senior gurus are doing in our community. Then uh, when we um, talked on the con uh, sorry consequences and the after effects after taking the medicines, so 13 of them have been suffering from depression and anxiety after taking the hormonal medicines uh, within the period of two months. And six out of 15 were reported severe pain in lower abdomen and testicles. Yeah, 
So this was a little bit shocking for us, but uh, when we asked that, have you left the taking the hormone medicine? So they said no, uh, because um, they were very much keen to get the transition and uh, they have uh, no like other way. So with uh, irrespective of getting that lower, uh, lower pain or depression or anxiety, they were very much consistent on to taking that medicines. Um, then <clears throat> another consequence was depression. Uh, the, the depression has led some of them using drugs as well. And uh, some like uh, one out of 13 also reported her suicidal attempt. So the depression has led to much extent that she wants to suicide. So these were, that was a little, that was very shocking because uh, here we see that there is no psychosocial support being given to them. So that's where they have to deal with their mental stability. Um, they have no support. Um, so that's why like they were, one of them was uh, like considering a suicidal attempt and um, others were using drugs just to just to avoid the depression and anxiety so these were basically the findings and uh, now we can have the communication okay so when we talk about the conclusions and uh, we have seen that um, the, more, most of them were open to high risk of mental and physical problems due to lack of awareness and uh, medical facilities. Then we have seen that there is uh, much need of having a psychosocial support. They must be having a knowledge enhancement sessions or counseling awareness sessions. The thing is when we've seen like many of our uh, specialists or doctors, even they don't know about uh, this transition process. And if they do know, they don't, uh, they don't want to um, take up the case or took up the case for the transition thing um, because um, it's not been supported, I would say, in our country this right now, the transition process. But on the other hand, uh, the transgender community is very much to follow the transition process through hormonal intake or through surgeries or even through castration. Um, Uh, everyone can hear me because I have an internet. Yes, Hello. yes, we can hear you. Okay. Please continue. Oh, thank you, thank you. So uh, the psychosocial. So I was uh, talking on the psychosocial support and the doctors. Uh, the uh, then uh, the there's a need to establish a referral linkages with healthcare settings, including transitioning process. So uh, there is much needed that uh, the doctors and the medical centers must uh, have. Mm, this facility for the transgender persons. Right now, I would say um, the medical facilities access is very limited for us. And uh, the last thing which we have seen is the need for the post follow-up mechanism, because obviously once you've been given the medicine, the, the after effects is very, like I would say, um, this, uh, this is much needed and uh, it's, it's it, routine checkups and consultations and the hormonal tests, regular uh, checkups. So these are really important things which you have to follow if you are taking hormones or you are on a transition process. So we haven't, uh, so this is a much needed uh, which we have seen conclusions. So, uh, well, uh, this was the research carried out in October 2019 and uh, we are working on the well-being and even health so after seeing the conclusions and taking up the findings like we have seen that we have to like work on it because um, as a community-led organization um, and we have the exposure internationally and uh, we are much empowered to get referral linkages with the healthcare provider. Just the um, Transgender Protection Right uh, Act 2018. So we have now the <clears throat> 
legal right to access the medical facilities and we can claim it by um, building linkages with the healthcare providers. So we've been working, me and my organization are working on this process to even have a kind of a guideline, um, hormonal guidelines, which can be followed. Uh, secondly, we are making um, linkages with the laboratories where they can have the tests or hormonal tests so they, they can know the level of their um, like different hormones or uh, according to them the dose can be prescribed secondly we are in linkages with the specialists who have who have a uh, who are specialized in uh, hormonal therapies uh, so they can be uh, they can provide the facility so uh, if we can move to the last slide yeah so uh, uh, the number one thing which we've done is we've been uh, we have created a advocacy toolkit and an action plan to get access to for health rights uh, basically it's um, following the transgender protection act we been uh, we've been done this just for the implementation so we can get the um, health access uh, uh, the health rights access to uh, by different uh, to different hospitals and secondly we've been created sensitization guidelines for the healthcare providers. These sensitization guidelines are very important right now because the whole medical centers are not sensitized, basically. I'm not talking only about the doctors, basically. The, um, the whole staff of the hospital or the clinic need to be sensitized right now uh, from the guard, from those who are sitting on the reception or the, the other like cleaning staff or the compounders or the paramedicals. They need to get sensitized about the third gender, the transgender person, because uh, uh, the discrimination and the harassment we face uh, just led us to avoid uh, this situation and we don't uh, most of the transgender people don't visit hospitals so sensitization guidelines uh, are like uh, been very really helpful for us as uh, and secondly we are also um, doing the sensitization sessions at different medical centers as well as at our like organizations with the healthcare providers and their staff just to make them sensitize that uh, you can have a transgender patient and a transgender client as well and you have to treat them as patient uh, without being uh, discriminating or harassing them. So uh, the main thing which we are working on it, and uh, so the above the, uh, the advocacy toolkit and sensitization guidelines have been already created and implemented. And um, now we are working on the hormonal guidelines and we've been collaborated with uh, four different organizations who are working on transgender people across Pakistan. And uh, we are now working on creating this hormonal guidelines, which will be, uh, which will soon be published and be endorsed by uh, renowned doctors and uh, uh, being um, distributed among the community so they can follow the uh, standard guidelines. Um, along uh, this, this can this can provide, I would say, um, information. This will provide the um, general information or standard information how to start the transition process. But obviously, they have uh, the along with that, we have to make the, the sensitization and awareness sessions as well, because. Um, um, the human body reacts like every human body reacts differently. So they have to undergo the uh, psy uh, psychiatric session, psychologist test, uh, sessions. Uh, along with that, they have to go to the hormonal tests as well as uh, they have to do um, hormonal tests and um, as well as they have to consult a specialized doctor. So for this, we are, as I told, we have uh, referral linkages. Uh, other for the psychosocial support, uh, we have created a drop, we have drop in center services in our organization. So for this, we are doing this like um, we have a psychologist in our organization. So we are like providing a facility if someone wants to start a transition, he can go and consult how to start. Uh, uh, the one aspect is what we have found is the depression and anxiety which can be overcome by the support which we are providing right now. And the last is the referral linkages with the government and private health healthcare centers as I already like uh, <clears throat> discussed.
So these were the action plan, my organization and me for 2020 and 2021 are right now doing. And uh, in terms of like, uh, we, are uh, we are hoping that uh, the, the current status or the current issue will be solved or to some extent will be um, resolved in the future and uh, thank you again thank you so much for this was um, all what uh, uh, for my abstract and again thank you so much everyone for um, considering me and taking me thank you so much um, thank you very much uh, Malik for your presentations and uh, for your work and um, uh, your work, uh, you know, I think the issues uh, faced by trans community on the hormonal use is uh, not only in uh, Pakistan, I think across uh, our regions. And I, we did the, almost a, a similar study with yours and in Cambodia, we found the same, that uh, trans community uh, using uh, hormone without uh, consultation and just hearsay from uh, their peer. So it seemed like, uh, you know, you have done a great job. And, you know, I, I think that your recommendation is uh, very relevant, not only in Pakistan, but uh, to us as well. And uh, I wish you all the best uh, in continuing uh, your uh, work plan. And thank you very much. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you. And uh, our... Uh, for uh, abstract presenters, uh, Sitasari Prabhavanti. Uh, she as the uh, she is the director of uh, Siklus Indonesia. Sitasari Prabhavanti manage and implement military specific HIV AIDS prevention, care and treatment program in Indonesia. The program is to reduce the number of new HIV infections and other sexually transmitted diseases among members of the Indonesian military. She is the implementing, she is also implementing a pre-post intervention study of stigma and discrimination and its psychological related factors among real HIV patients, healthcare workers and non healthcare worker in five military health facility in Jakarta. Additionally, she managed a UNFPA funded youth sexual and reproductive health social franchising model. And she has more than 20 years experience in program management and program design, in research and technical expertise in, in strategic behavior change communication intervention. Sitar Sari Prabhavanti, uh, today uh, her title is, her abstract title is Sexual Identity, Sexual Orientation, Sexual Risk, and Condom Use Behaviors of Clients of Transgender Sex Workers in Jakarta, Indonesia. Over to you, Prabhavanti. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sifon Far, and then uh, Good afternoon for everyone in here, and also maybe good morning and good evening because we come from different uh, country, so uh, different islands. So this afternoon, I would like to uh, present my abstract uh, about the sorry, about the sexual identity, sexual orientation, sexual risk, and condom use behavior of clients of transgender sex worker in Jakarta, Indonesia. So the ob objective of the study is to uh, examine the components of the sexual identity, sexual orientation, sexual risk taking and protective behavior of clients of transgender sex worker or client of TSW in Jakarta, Indonesia. So uh, generally we usually are uh, doing a study in the transgender. So this time I would like to know further about the clients of transgender sex worker that uh, commonly they come to the transgender sex worker uh, during commercials, uh, during commercial sex uh, time and also uh, in some places in Jakarta, Indonesia. <clears throat> uh, they are as one party in the decision to use condoms during anal sex to prevent HIV transmission. Clients can play an important role as a bridging population in the prevention of the spread 
of HIV. Then the study therefore aim to answer the question, first, who are the client of a transgender sex worker? Do they practice risk behavior? Do they practice pro protective behavior by using a condom? The method to use them are client of transgender sex worker, <clears throat> uh, they are 250 were recruited and interviewed by transgender women or warrior. So we call it transgender women in Indonesia as warrior. So for doing this study, uh, for interviewing the client of transgender sex worker, we uh, collaborate with transgender women instead of men or, or women. And then we are uh, using structured questionnaire immediately after completing a commercial sex transaction with a transgender sex worker. Then we collaborated with the warrior organization in Jakarta to get access to the commercial sex sites and to approach the field coordinators that they called as MAMI in the five district in Jakarta. The warrior organization informed the MAMI about this project and asked their permission to conduct the study. The mommy approached the transgender sex worker and explained the purpose of the study and the, and the interviewers contacted the transgender sex worker and used them as the key contact to reach the client. The result of the study are the average age of the client was 27 years old, over 50% had completed high school or more. And most of the clients were married, but only about 11% were living with a wife or regular female partner in Jakarta. So they are basically migrant, uh, migrant people. Oral and insertive anal sex was the most prevalent sexual behavior with transgender sex worker. 50% did insertive anal sex with, and they seem very much to prefer to receive oral sex. 95% from transgender sex worker during commercial sex transaction. <clears throat> more than 80% of the clients had more than once visited transgender sex workers. So we can say that 80% of them, they are like regular client of transgender sex worker. And only 50% of them always use condoms during insertive anal sex. About half of the clients describe themselves as heterosexual and most others describe themselves as bisexual. Overall, the clients felt sexually most attractive to women, fantasized most about having sex with women, and felt much more masculine than feminine. And almost all participants, uh, almost 92% said that they did not have feminine traits at all. So we can see in this figure that <clears throat> the heterosexual they are feel sexually they feel more sexually attracted to female and the bisexual or homosexual they more feel sexually attracted to transgender and to male discussion the clients were young married migrant workers with a mid education level and living separately from their wife or their regular partner they describe themselves as heterosexual and most others describe themselves as bisexual. Overall, the clients felt sexually most attracted to and fantasized most about having sex with women. They felt more masculine than feminine. Oral and insertive anal sex was the most prevalent sexual behavior with transgender sex worker. This finding suggests they had multiple, multiple sex partners during a period of time was they did not consistently practice condom use during every sex act. Sex with transgender sex worker is primarily a substitute for sex with women. We can see here in the figure two uh, that the heterosexual, the, 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 heter the heterosexual client, they feel more masculine uh, than the bisexual or homosexual client, they feel more feminine. I think that's all my presentation now. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rambavanti, uh, for the excellent uh, presentations and uh, for your uh, effort in uh, the studies. And I'm sure that the finding uh, will shed light and uh, share with the uh, publics so that uh, all the public would understand what is going on and uh, 
as we said earlier, we can use this to raise public awareness and get the support for the cause of the LGBT uh, community. Uh, thank you again for your contribution. Um, our last is the voice from the front lines, uh, Kushana Kapali. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about her uh, experience. Sukana Kapali is a 21 years old trans woman, is a right activist in Nepal at the forefront of the gender recognition laws. She is a blogger, writer, and has published various books around Sochi in Nepal and Nepal Russia, in Nepalese and Nepal Russia. She is also the first trans woman in Nepal to apply for legal documentation as female. So the floor over to you, uh, Kapali. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so I don't have a presentation. Uh, you'll have to look at my face when I'm going to talk. Um, thank you very much for giving me this floor to talk about this very important topic. I'll share some of my experiences, views, and thoughts regarding transgender rights and issues in Nepal. In the past decades, many of you may have widely heard of certain narratives about Nepal's transgender movement or the LGBTIQ rights movement. That we are a very LGBTIQA friendly country has been promoted and disseminated through various national and international media outlets. This claim is widely reported uh, and many people believe that queer people in Nepal have afforded all possible legal rights. It's common to hear that Nepal, uh, hear Nepal referred as a beacon of LGBT rights or that Nepal has some of the most progressive laws regarding LGBTI rights. It's also believed that Nepal is especially progressive when it comes to addressing rights of transgender people. All these romanticizations about Nepal fail to look into grassroots levels and the actual issues faced by the population because it's a lie to say that Nepal has afforded all possible legal rights for transgender people. Um, to look particularly into gender recognition, Nepal does not have any law that supports gender recognition for transgender people and whoever is getting like um, their, their documentation on basis of their gender identity or accessing loopholes, certain loops, loopholes that are available in the law. But the law uh, clearly does not state that transgender people can acquire citizenship or amend their existing citizenship based on their gender identity. Um, transgender people cannot easily access education as cisgender peers. For example, I myself have been fighting since three years now for a registration number at Trivuvan University, the largest and the oldest university of Nepal, which has denied me from enrollment because my educational certificate from my school are not congruent with the gender I identify as with. Um, and on the other hand, when I apply for amendment of the my past, like my school certificates, the institution that issues it does not uh, want amend me that for me, citing that there is no law um, to support this amendment. Um, one of the biggest problem for Nepal is that the state thinks being LGBTI five five very fixed categories, LGBTI, means being a third gender, which is completely very wrong, which is one of the very biggest problem we are facing that people think LGBTI is a third gender, completely like disregarding that, okay, sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics, there are three different things. Like lesbian, gay is a different thing. Bisexual is a different thing. There are lesbian, gay, bisexual is sexual orientation. Being transgender is a gender identity. And being intersex is, uh, uh, a sex characteristics, completely ignoring that, like a lot of people think in Nepal that LGBTI is a third gender, which is one of the biggest problem and barriers we're facing right now. Forcing transgender men and women as third gender is not establishment of our right, but, but establishment of a violation. Because a lot of people think, oh, Nepal brought like from 2007, brought a third gender um, option. So it's a very progressive uh, move towards um, LGBTI rights or transgender rights, but it's false because we transgender people, we, we transgender women want to take F. 
transgender men want to take male. Similarly, intersex people can also have gender identity, which can be male, female, or non-binary. And again, like lesbian, gay, bisexual is not gender identity at all, but also they are forced to take the third gender identity. And in similar ways, um, there are people who identify as non-binary, but not necessarily the term third gender, because third gender is very as much associated to a religious and monolithic identity. Uh, what we call as a tritiya vadi stance that has prompted, encouraged, and propagated rampant fear and transphobia within beyond the third gender community of Nepal by prescribing that anything beyond a Hindu-centric third gender identity is the threat to community. So we also face a lot of um, uh, attacks, a lot of, you know, like discrimination from the third, from people who identify as third gender who say that, okay, this is our religious and cultural blah, blah, blah. And then everyone has to conform to this notion. Otherwise you are like, um, like doing something that's a threat to the community. Uh, I, on behalf of Queer Youth Group, Transgender Rights Collective, and all the queer rights advocates from Nepal, urge government, international organization, United Nations agencies, regional network development agencies, funding agencies, and other duty bearers to address, to push addressing the gender recognition in Nepal, um, which allows self-determination of gender identity and not force people to identify as third gender and rather establish a comprehensive understanding about sexual orientation gender um, rather than putting up everyone into a third gender box um, that we also urge to stop thinking out of the box and bring an end to the misconception that LGBTI is a third gender, bring an end to forcing people as third gender, and rather establish and also promote and support people who are at the grassroots level, raising their voice for this, for the movement. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Th uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Rukshana Kapati for uh, sharing the uh, stories and uh, raising the issues of uh, gender recognition uh, in uh, Nepal. Um, thanks you, thank you for your uh, contribution. So, um, so now uh, we uh, conclude uh, the uh, sessions. So, uh, and then I will hand uh, over to. Uh, Shoba for handling the uh, questions and answer uh, session. So having uh, having uh, listened to uh, all of our uh, speakers and uh, presenters, you know, I I think you know there's that there are many studies about uh, transgenders, um, and, but uh, focusing mainly on uh, HIV/AIDS. So uh, many programs have been. Uh, paying attention on uh, to LGBT issue from HIV aid uh, corner, and short of more comprehensive approach, right ways to ensure LGBT individuals can act freely as other citizens. And um, I think uh, one of the venue to achieve um, the uh, LGBT. Um, rise is the country need to continue to raise public awareness about sexual orientation and gender identity through research as uh, our speaker have done public forum and advocacy so that public at large understand and support our issues. And uh, as uh, the uh, JLP uh, presented, Another important pathway to address the sexual orientations and gender identity issue is through uh, using universal periodic uh, review, which is an important uh, mechanism uh, that uh, many of you uh, have uh, experienced. And, and I think we need only to continue uh, to use this uh, venue to uh, address uh, the issue. And uh, having listened to um, our uh, presentations and recommendations, uh, I feel like we, we need to create the opportunities and space for the activists, CSO and government and the public to continue to discuss and come together to solve this long-standing issue in our human history. 
and we look forward to a future which we all live in a society where all individuals who decide and act freely regardless of their sexual orientations and gender identity. And again, thank you very much for uh, our speakers today uh, for your valuable contributions. And I'm sure that the uh, viewer, the participations in the Zoom uh, have learned a lot from uh, your hard work and we continue to carry on what we have uh, providing the, in the recommendation and the conclusion. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Shobhas, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Van. We'll get back to, we'll go back to you once again after the Q&A session. So we now have the open session. Uh, participants, please type in your comments or questions in the chat box. And those watching on the Facebook uh, can type in the comments box there. Uh, before we take up the questions, uh, I can see Situ Streshta in the audience. And Situ is a member of M for M, Me for Myself campaign. Uh, which is an international campaign that promotes mental health and well-being by engaging the youth of Asia Pacific. So, Sito, would you like to say something, a short comment from you? Yes, Sito. Um, so, am I audible? Yes, you are very audible, yes. Uh, so, I guess uh, my video is not on. You can speak, please. Okay. So uh, thank you, Shobha, ma'am. And hello, namaste, and a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the speakers, guests, and uh, listeners who are from different parts of the world. I am Situ Shrestha from Nepal, a peer educator of uh, YPR Nepal and a founding member of Me For Myself. Uh, Me For Myself is an international youth-based campaign promoting mental health and well-being, focusing uh, Asia Pacific. So firstly, uh, before I speak a bit about uh, what is me for myself, I would like to congratulate all the speakers, presenters, and the listeners, as well as the member of uh, APCRSHR10 for successfully organizing 14 thematic uh, sessions on the different themes of SRHR, uh, COVID-19 impact, and SDG. I'm really honored and uh, to present YPA Asia Pacific and M4M uh, campaign today. So. Uh, 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 I would like to say a bit about uh, what is me for myself, as uh, we are living in a new normal and due to this ongoing pandemic, and uh, as today we have discussed from uh, different presenters uh, such as Soba and Rukshana about LGBTIQ uh, issues, discrimination, and COVID impact that has uh, caused uh, young youth uh, mental illness. So. Focusing that, uh, we have launched a mental illness uh, campaign, naming it Me For, Ni uh, Me For Myself. So uh, Me For Myself is an international program where we are currently engaging young youth and uh, from, two, uh, from 17 different nations. And uh, currently we have 250 volunteers from 17 different nations, forming them into 20 groups. Uh, where we are engaging them into mental health and well-being uh, scenario, educating themselves, learning, as well as providing them a content not just about anxiety, depression, or suicide, but uh, mental illness such as PMS, premenstrual syndrome, PMDD, eating disorder, uh, and uh, uh, panic attack, uh, bullying, the effect of bullying on LGBTI community people, harassment on people with disability. Uh, these are some of the signs and uh, factors that is uh, directly and indirectly affecting uh, mental well-being of especially young youth. So uh, this way we are engaging these 250 volunteers in a safe platform where they are engaging themselves, creating a perfect network and learning about mental health as well as learning different kinds of skills. For example, making posters, uh, videos, uh, podcasts, sharing their positive stories and uh, perspective. And uh, this way we are running, the on, uh, running this uh, Me For Myself ongoing campaign. And uh, this is how, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we do not have uh, much time. So I'm uh, speaking very less. So this is how uh, we, me for myself, team and volunteers are working together promoting mental health. 
and uh, concluding my small speak about mental health and me for myself, what is uh, me for myself actually doing, I still believe that the COVID-19 pandemic has not just uh, made our daily life challenging, but also has provided an opportunity for positive involvement, participation, and a very strong insight about the importance of mental health and well-being. And I also believe this issue will be heard and realized how important it is. Once again, uh, thank you so much for hearing me out. I really enjoyed sharing um, about me for myself in this platform. I will share the link of me for myself and uh, live now in the chat box for more information. Also, I would like to thank uh, Lucy, uh, sign language interpreter for the support. And uh, yes, thank you everyone. Uh, over to you, Shubha ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Situ. Uh, I have a question from Balaji Pindi, who's the district HIV AIDS program manager uh, from Vizianagram in India. And uh, he says that I have been working with transgender community since 10 years for HIV AIDS prevention and empowerment. And I want to learn more about gender identity. Uh, so I'm sure today's session has given him a lot of food for thought regarding gender identity. But if any of the speakers want to share something else, uh, they are free to do so. The floor is theirs. If anybody would like to say anything regarding gender identity. And I'm sure as Rukshana has also said, there are a lot of misconceptions uh, regarding this concept and people need to be made more aware about it. So um, what do our speakers have to say there? Dr. Var? Would you like to comment? Um, the, um, you know, I, I saw one uh, question is also asking about uh, Cambodia, whether we have- uh, Yes, yes, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that also. Yes, I'll, I'll <laughs> turn to that. Yes, right. yes, okay. And okay. I, I think, you know, uh, in Cambodia, the, uh, the issue of gender identity is um, similar uh, much similar to what our presenter have uh, told us. So uh, face a similar uh, issue to uh, some extent. But as uh, our colleagues, uh, Lia P, J. Lia P. Hay, uh, she presented uh, earlier, uh, Cambodia uh, with the gender identity, we are, uh, we are, because we are in the uh, modest, uh, uh, society and uh, it's tolerate, we are tolerant for the, uh, all the gender uh, identity of uh, sexual orientation uh, people. And um, having said this, it does not mean that uh, we don't have uh, discrimination uh, issues in, in Cambodia. Discrimination is still widespread, but uh, not that uh, really violence in some other setting in other uh, country. But of course, you know, there's a violence from time to time, but uh, most prevalent is uh, subtle discriminations in the workplace, in the economic participations and in school. So um, I think we uh, just need to continue to what we have said, and I hope the best uh, will come. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Var. Uh, we have a question from Ten Wang Thur. Uh, we popularly, popularly call him Doc Q, who's a very senior journalist from Myanmar. And uh, he has raised a very pertinent issue that when translating LGBTIQ into Myanmar language, uh, I try to get the right and more polite terms, the words which our people will understand and uh, also realizing the sensitivity of the issue. Uh, are there such challenges which are there in Cambodia also? Uh, he wants to know. Uh, and maybe that applies to other countries as well. So uh, Dr. Var, can you speak for Cambodia? And then perhaps uh, Leafy can add something to that. Yes, Dr. Var. Yeah, I, I think I would uh, ask uh, Leafy, uh, okay. you know, be the most appropriate. Yes, right? yes. yes. And uh, she's been working on this. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, yes Lisa. Thank you. Um, uh, it is a very respectful question from him when the media asked 
uh, what kind of language do they uh, uh, could they use to uh, uh, call or uh, to name for our community so that's similar challenge uh, to the media in Cambodia as well so uh, we have research uh, done that uh, we had the, the term for general LGBT community but most of uh, our community are not referred to be called that uh, however we use a uh, people who love same sex. Uh, so it's for general uh, and then explanation after that. Uh, but we, we also recommend for the media to ask first, especially to the organizations and the group who are representing their community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think um, uh, we, could, we want to hear from Sarita and Sipta Sari also. When you are using those terms in your language, do you come across problems uh, there also? So, Sipta Sari from in Indonesia in Bahasa, do you come across any such problem? Okay. Um, when we mention about the uh, LGBT, actually, in for every for every um population, we have uh, we have different term. Like for transgender, we call it varia, and then for uh, <clears throat> gay men, uh, this is not very specific, but. You, you say like uh, they call it as a chong, uh, sometimes like uh, that's come from being chong. This is not, uh, but this is like more similar like waria. So, um, and for uh, uh, the, what you call it, the lesbian, um, we call it, uh, I don't think they, we have a very, very specific uh, term for, for lesbian, but you know, I think the most popular one that uh, having, having what you call it, very specific name is the transgender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So of course for if we what you call it, uh, talking about this uh, specific population in the, uh, during our life and in daily life, when they meet with the, gener with the general people, general population, maybe sometimes they feel like uh, very weird. And I, I, I do not deny that uh, people generally, they still have like kind of uh, what you call it, looking, the, uh, look down to, to, uh, to our, our friend that they call it as LGBT. Thank you. Uh, Sobo, what about <coughs> Pakistan? I believe uh, if you are using the local language that is Urdu, do you come across such problems? Using uh, the correct right human, uh, human rights based language. Sobo, if you are there. Okay, Sarita, can you share please? using the terms in Hindi and maybe other languages. India has so many yes. languages. Oh, hello. Yeah, yes, all right. In India, all right. in India also, we are using many, many terms, uh, local terms. Hijra, Kinar, Koti, Jogapas, etc. But uh, I can't differentiate between uh, who is, uh, which term is used for transgender and uh, which term is used for lesbian like that. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. but uh, many terms are there, like Koti, Jogapas, Shiv Shakti, mm -hmm. Tirunambis, Bhaiya, like many, many terms are used for referring to the transgender community. And in India, it is argued that historically they had an important role in ancient culture. Yeah. Later it, uh, during the British rule or uh, something like that, the uh, status changed to the lower one. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Sobo, yes, now we are back to Sobo. Yes, Sobo. Would you like? We, we, can't, we can't hear you. No, your voice is breaking, Sobo. Your voice is yeah, breaking. Uh, a little bit of internet. Yeah, I have a little bit of internet issue, I think. Okay. Issue. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me clearly? Yes, yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Well, yes, The if we talk on the... Yeah, if we talk on the language, uh, the or country language, like and the names which we've been called, like uh, I can say that uh, from the childhood to I would say maturity, the name change uh, because uh, when you are in transition and you are not transitioned, uh, there are different like 
voice is breaking uh, and voice this is kind breaking. of things and when you are transition then um, the most commonly used word is hmm. okay hello 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 yes 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 hello, hello. yes hello we can hear you yes yeah mm -hmm. yes and uh, as uh, if we consider the transgender term in urdu or in over uh, in our culture it's called the khwaja sera basically khwaja sera is the right word which it is used uh, which is not derogatory basically and is respected in or in pakistan yeah okay thank you thank you very thank much you. and i think this is a very important question uh, not to ruffle the to be very sensitive when we are using different terms and uh, very often the local language uh, perhaps is uh, not good enough or is not that vibrant to to be able to incorporate of uh, the different uh, nuances of it uh, we have a question from kalpana acharya who is editor in uh, editor in chief of health tv online nepal and she is chairperson of health journalist forum and also founding member of apcat media and uh, she wants to know if media engagement is important to raise the gender identity issue uh, and the question is directed to leafy but uh, i'm sure others can add something to that yes leafy thanks kapana for the questions uh, it's indeed very important to uh, engage media as i mentioned in the presentations that we want to change both mind and uh, uh law so when uh, they start to accepting lgbt they start to, uh, you know passing the laws uh, and media is uh, one of the agencies to communicate that kind of information to the public and as you can uh, hear from uh, our college in nepal uh, people still assuming transgender and uh, transgender and lgbt are on the different category that kind of things uh, make the media writing wrong stories and giving wrong information and i also see some comments uh, in the chat box that sharing about yes. lgbt that in on the film they uh, they have the narrative in the negative light so uh sensitize the media is very important uh, from our experience we start uh, very little bit evident uh, sorry the event base uh, communicate try to understand the media uh, what kind of story that attract them so that we uh, could work with the media to change this narrative about uh, LGBT community uh, okay this answer your question thank you thank you uh, Roxana would you like to add something to that yeah, I think because I come from Nepal and par yes. particularly it's been a very, very, very huge issue for us uh, when it comes to language and when it comes to like uh, media representation of LGBTIQ issues or transgender people. It's it's, it's it's a very prominent issue right now what we are facing because media, no matter how many times we try to like say, okay, this is the correct terminology, but the media does not want to use that kind of language or that kind of terminology because um, it's like, it's if you use more abusive or more bullying uh, kind of like terminology, it's more of clickbait. A lot of people will click. You know? For example, if you use the title like, oh, look at this very weird kind of couple that got married, then it's more like attracting the clickbaits rather than putting a respectful terminology out there. Um, so yeah, I, th I think uh, it's important to engage with media and if people in media, because if uh, media of Nepal would like to engage with us or if international medias would like to engage on issues of Nepal, then I'm more than happy to provide different resources that we publish. We've, uh, Nepal also has a lot of different languages and right now we publish a lot of resources around like Sajisek issues in Nepali and Nepal Basha. So if you'd li like to have those resources, then please feel happy to connect with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I don't think it's only about Nepal. It, this is a problem in many countries. And, and as Rashmi Kumar from India says that even reporting of violence on LGBT is, is reported in news media often as blaming them instead of uh, perpetrating the violence. And that I think is not only for LGBT community, but I think for women per se also. We talk of that such a such woman was raped 
We never say a man raped the woman. So I think that sort of a narrative needs to change. And uh, the HIV field has also, HIV movement has shown us uh, that how rights-based language is important. So we now talk of people living with HIV and not victims of HIV. So I think using that word victim, in most cases, I think that uh, that's a very insensitive and inhuman way of uh, uh, reporting anything. So right, uh, media plays really a big, very big role. Uh, we have a, a comment come question from Rashmi Kumar again that peer groups and community led intervention interventions are important and we also need community led psychosocial support. Uh, so are there any examples of this from different countries? Uh, Savita, uh, uh, Sarita, would you like to say something on that? any such interventions which are happening in India, and then we can uh, talk of other countries as well, go to other countries. Yeah, the, there are many organizations called Pahachan and mm -hmm. Avahan and uh, Ahodeya Samiti are conducting uh, such intervention programs. And there are evidences uh, which uh, tells that increased condom use with regular and casual partners and access to outreach uh, yeah, access to outreach, education, and testing and counseling are increased to it for HIV. Except, yes, are such evidences are there. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, Cambodia, Leafy, would you like to add something to that in Cambodia? Specific to that question. Uh, sorry, the question is on the psychological support. Yes, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Uh, as in my presentation mentioned yes. about the issue of family violence and discrimination at workplace, uh, one of the services needed by our community is psychological support as well. But we see the lack of this kind of service that uh, appropriate to uh, the community, especially the service provider, has to be aware of uh, SOTI as well. So we. Uh, some of uh, our network has been working on that, sharing on mental health information, but we do need a uh, service for the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sipta, sorry. Uh, what about psychosocial support uh, uh, interventions uh, in Indonesia? Um, yeah, actually, um, there are some support available for the uh, trash especially for the PLHIV, including, of course, the transgender population, uh, when they, uh, this is not only uh, covering the issues of HIV per se, but also covering the issues of uh, uh, other uh, what is stigma and discrimination related issues. So then the transgender sex worker also uh, can get their what you call it, their right as uh, other uh, population in Indonesia uh, because as you know that the transgender uh, population usually they come from the middle of the uh, middle of economic level and then if they can get a similar or equal uh, opportunity as others they can also be uh, productive and also can contribute to the uh, to the what you call it, to the country so actually uh, if we give them uh, opportunity, they will get it. Uh, and as you know, because the transgender population, usually they get um, what call it, stigma and discrimination from very early age, when they uh, starting their, uh, usually they starting uh, realize their ident identity when they have poverty. And because of that, then they get like kind of stigma discrimination uh, during a uh, uh, teenager and in the school. That's where they uh, often, oftenly, very often they, what you call it, um, kick off uh, from the system or drop off from the school because uh, this kind of uh, treatment from uh, other people uh, in this case from other students or even from other or from the, the teacher or from the school so uh, it's very important to provide uh, psych psychosocial support for uh, uh, transgender uh, population uh, in terms of the uh, to support to support them so they are able to function as other uh, population in the country. Thank you. Uh, there is a comment from Ay Natakan from Thailand. And A says that in Thailand, education for, for the transgenders has helped them get jobs. Uh, and I think that's a very important issue 
she has raised because from personal experience i have been to thailand several times and i have found uh, at least on a comparative basis, basis from what i see in my country uh, a much better integration of uh, the transgender community with the others and uh, it's it's very it's very difficult to differentiate one from the from uh, them from the rest and they are really at least i find them as part of the mainstream society uh, so uh, do any of our uh, speakers do they want to comment on this the role of education as many of you have said that all it starts from early in life and that is the time when we really need to orient uh, uh, everyone towards that so any comments from our speakers on this the role of education starting from and other life skills right from the beginning yeah hello i yes. uh, i need to yes. comment basically yes. Yes. yeah yes. education is a very important uh, role in the life building or the career building of a transgender person which we've seen that we uh, as an organization are now creating opportunities in the public and private sector we are linking with different corporate organizations with public organizations but uh, to some extent uh, our community lack in education and um, getting the degrees basically um the thing is that uh, now the government after the uh, pass of the act uh, the trans protection act uh, they have uh, we have the rights to uh, access the education in the institutions um and we been implementing and many of the institutions are now adding the third column but uh, there is a need to sensitize the uh, the the society basically most of the transgenders have left their education due to harassment and uh, due to discrimination basically and uh, education yes plays a very important role so uh, right now we are focusing that those who are teenagers and those who are in the age where uh, they need to get education so we are focusing to get them enrolled in different institutions organizations uh, one of the thing which we are facing is the uh, switch cost basically as most of them are living independently earning from begging or i would say sex work or some other means so uh, they don't have time to get now education they have now uh, some of the access and they can get the education to by some institutions and uh, to some extent the government is providing free education as well but the switch cost is like if they if they are getting education they have to compromise their earning and it uh, like leads like to some extent uh, like uh, their income they cannot earn as much as they want to so this is one of the perspective and education is like uh, now when the organizations and different um, public and private organizations are considering to hire trans persons now in pakistan but this is one of the main i would say drawback uh, of the community that they have uh, no education yes uh, and i like i also support this com uh, uh, comment that uh, education plays a very important role and we have to work on it uh, on priority basis yeah okay. thank you uh, thank you so much and you are a chartered accountant so i'm sure you must be leading the way there uh, and uh, 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 the cambodia situation leafy would you like to please uh, i think this is a very important point about education uh, would you like to add something uh yes sure um education is of course play a big role for the uh have a better employment opportunity but there are some more loopholes that we have to look at for example how to uh keep uh the uh, student at school um uh, which uh, they could expose to bullying and harassment uh, that uh, lead them to drop out of school and there are the research that i shown in the presentation has uh found that a uh, transgender community who uh, applied for work uh, has been not selected because of their identity so these are uh, the gaps that the law has to look at to protect uh, the lgbt community thank you okay thank you uh, now one last question i'm taking before i hand over the mic to dr var once again and this is a question from calvin de los reyes and uh, calvin says how can we address transgender health when lgbtiq remains sidelined with stigma and discrimination where would a transgender individual run should they need support 
like hormonal medication, it is limited to the NGOs alone. How do prospective clients take advantage of the available support? Many questions, but I think very pertinent questions. So, Leafy, would you try to, you are the plenary speaker, would you try to take up this? It's basically regarding their health problems. Uh, thank you for the question. I think most of it may be Dr. Chi Wan will, could help okay. me with them. Uh, yes. One thing that I could say is on uh, the limitations of hormone therapy, because like in other country, which uh, the speakers have shared, uh, the trans community who are in need of uh, hormone therapy still access to uh, dangerous and uh, not professional uh, hormone. Uh, however, that also uh, come to this uh, fill this gap. They also have the service. I think Dr. Chiwan will be uh, in better place to share on this. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Bar. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, it's a uh, very good uh, questions, and I'm asking myself uh, almost all the time, and how the LGBT um, IQI people. Uh, can get those services while, uh, while they are on the sideline, uh, discriminations like that. So first, I think uh, most important, it's not the, uh, the service itself, but I think uh, LGBTI community need to stand up like what we have done today uh, in our forum. And of course, you know, in many other forums, in each of our countries. I think uh, we need to come together and do like what you've done today, collecting information and stories and telling the country, telling others. And the CSO activists, uh, private sector, join together and raise this awareness. Um, I think, you know, NGO uh, service from NGO alone is not enough. Uh, uh, we need to make the public uh, health uh, service provider aware of the issue, understand the issue faced by the LGBTI communities, and uh, they know. And of course, you know, like one of our presenter talking about guideline, uh, talking about sensitizing the uh, providers. I think that's how we uh, should uh, continue to. Uh, to follow uh, many of the recommendations uh, today. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, I we come to the end of the Q&A session. And uh, I now hand over the mic to Dr. Var once again, who has been the guiding spirit behind APCR SHR 10 virtual for his closing remarks. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Shobha, for uh, the uh, work today and what you have been uh, doing. So uh, as the uh, convener of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive Sexual Health and Rights, uh, I would like to thank each of you who are joining the conference today, including each of you who are viewing the conference and the CNS Facebook. I would like to thank uh, Rat and CNS team who have been working tirelessly to make this virtual conference a reality. The virtual conference is one of the new normal during the pandemic, and I'm sure that it will continue to be part of our future. And I would like to take uh, this opportunity to thank the Youth Steering Committee members, those who are behind the success of this conference the national and international steering committee members. You know, I would have asked them to stand in front of you in the on the podium, but um, due to this um, online virtual conference, I, I would like to uh, cite uh, their names. And without each of their expertise and commitment, we would not be able to organize this conference. And those are the people like, like uh, Dr. Ashish uh, Bharachaya from the Pop Councils, 
Professor Tian Tian Tai, former Vice Minister, Ministry of Health Myanmar, Sono Abe, uh, Professor Tian uh, Hul, Dr. So Kun from UNFPA, uh, Dr. Eden from uh, Philippine NGO Council Population Health and Welfare, and Jason Rokas from RTPF, um, Professor Peter Clinton Center for Res Social Research in Health at the uh, University of New South Wales, Sydney, and the youth at uh, Sarum, and Professor Chowal from NIPA, Neha Chohan from IPPF South Asia, uh, Catherine Kamkum from UNPA Regional Office, Sai Chotimai uh, Rachela from Aero in Kuala Lumpur, and Nga Dinfung from uh, Vinapa, uh, v, uh, Vietnam Public Health Association, and uh, Amy from uh, uh, Maristo. So these are uh, the people who uh, are working uh, from the beginning and behind the scene, and of course, you know, helping sharing uh, the session. And I would like to thank all of them. And with the work of these ISC members, International Steering Committee members, and the secretary, the conference received 938 abstracts. And without the pandemic, we plan to have 179 abstracts presented. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we cannot hold uh, this uh, in-person conference. With this uh, virtual conference, we managed to have 49 abstracts uh, presented. And through the series of this virtual conference, we have managed to bring all the 14 conference themes related to SIHR in Asia and the Pacific alive. And thanks again to all of you. All the speakers share with us the current situation of SIHR in their countries and in the region, as you have done today, providing insights and recommendations for countries, for government, private, and CSO who continue to do, to improve their work on SIHR. And the theme ranging from the one that we talked today on um, sexual orientation and gender identity to safe abortion, young people, people living with disability and SIHR, population aging, SIHR norms and behavior change, climate change, humanitarian support uh, response to financing SIHR. And through the uh, 14 sessions, uh, as you all know, this is the last one of these virtual conference. We have 1,000, approximately 1,900 participants uh, participated through Zoom. And more on Facebook with over 1,000 views for most sessions. So the total view of live session on Facebook were over 41,000. And uh, impressively, there were participants from 77 countries across the world. And as we uh, witnessed today, interaction between audience and speaker was uh, very great. And most of the session had gone beyond time. And chat stream of Zoom also showed very high engagement from participants. And some panelists responded to the questions and comments in real time, choosing chat box functions of Zoom. The conference has worked with uh, seven media fellows, and I would like to thank all of them, and about 100 articles written by them and published in local languages, such as Hindi, Thai, Burmese, and Nepalese, uh, which expands the reach of what con the conference intended to achieve. We are proud to have introduced sign language in our sessions and thanks uh, Lucy and John uh, for your effort in conveying the message to our colleagues and we of course you know did receive praise from the audience as you witnessed even with the sound number of participants and interaction I understand that there are challenges faced by certain vulnerable groups to participate in a virtual conference like this limited interaction amongst and between young people. And there are also limited participation from private for profit sector through in-person symposium or an exhibition. 
So our future conference will need to take these constraints into consideration. So having all these experiences, the International Steering Committee members, we met um, late last month, and our discussion was based on what we learned, as I just told you, and on the context of the uncertainty of the pandemic, and we hope, and with the hope that we have with the vaccine, from this discussion, the IEC unanimously emphasized the importance of Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive Sexual Health and Rights. It has been and is playing an important venue to achieve what the international community committed about SIHR. And we will announce, and I would like to emphasize this, and we will announce the next host of the 11th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive Sexual Health and Rights in June 2021. And the next conference on the 11th conference will be held in 2022. To close this 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive Sexual Health and Rights, I would like again to thank all of you indeed, the supporters, sponsors, donors, and I would like to take this brief opportunity to name the donors, UNIPA, IPPF, IFSU, Family Planning 2020, YPEER, have one of you participated here, Vietnam Public, Public Health Association, New Venture Fund, and an anonymous donor, uh, Parker Foundation, John Hopkins, Hop Council, IPAS, Farm Tree Foundation, PSI, Get Pharma. We have one private uh, uh, pharma to uh, also supporting the conference. And I would like to thank again the Secretary of Staff at RAC, the ISC and the NSC member, of course, the CNS, uh, Shobas, and Bobby behind the scene. Bobby, we never seen your face. And uh, the Royal Government of Cambodia, in particular, the Ministry of Health, for making this conference happen. So we are now close to the end of the year, and I would like to take this opportunity to wish you a Merry Christmas for those who celebrate Christmas, even if it is a small one at home. And wish each of you a Happy New Year 2021, and we will see you in 2022. So I declare the conference is closed now. Uh, thank you very much, Indy. Shobha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Var. And as you have said, we come to the close of this session and also we draw the curtains on the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. And from the CNS team and from my side, our sincere thanks to all the chairpersons, plenary speakers and abstract presenters as well as our sign language interpreters, our audience for their invaluable contributions to, this, to the virtual sessions of this largest Asia Pacific regional conference on sexual and reproductive health and rights. And this conference explored the theme of SRHR in Asia Pacific 2030 SDG vision and the 2020 realities. And uh, Dr. Barr has already thanked UNFP and IPPF for their continuous and unstinted support. And not to forget Dr. Barr himself and his dedicated team for their amazing guidance. 2020 has been a very difficult year for all of us, but let us keep the faith that good health, peace and prosperity will prevail in the times to come. So stay healthy, stay safe, and bye till we meet at the 11th APCR SHR 10. Bye to all. Namaskar. <laughs>